Okay, so let's get into this. You sent over some uh, really fascinating material about Mount Etna, quite dramatic stuff happening there recently. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's a great example of piecing together a complex event using different kinds of observations. Definitely. And that's sort of our goal here, isn't it? To walk through the sources you provided, look at what they show, you know, the flows, the seismic readings, even the satellite stuff, and we'll figure out the sequence. Right. And understand what makes this particular event significant. Yeah. And you mentioned some uh, really intriguing details, too, like Phoenix clouds. We'll have to touch on that. You certainly will. So the sources you've got, they really highlight that first big event, a... Uh, Pretty strong pyroclastic flow from the southeast crater. Right. Pyroclastic flows. Those are the really fast, super dangerous currents. They, Hot gas, ash, rock, everything moving together. Exactly. Super destructive. And the source is pointed to a specific reason for this one happening, like a trigger. Yes. They strongly suggest um, it kicked off because material piled up and then basically became unstable on the northern flank of that crater. Ah, okay. So, like, the cone built up too much on one side and then just sort of slumped. Or collapsed. Pretty much. Yeah. Think of it like a small landslide starting high up on the cone. Your sources, especially those webcam time lapses you included, they almost let you see it. Yeah, I saw that. You can kind of see material gathering near the eastern rim, maybe starting to slide a bit. Mm -hmm. And that initial slide, maybe the release of weight or perhaps the impact when it fell, seems to have destabilized a much larger section. Got it. So a bigger chunk then failed. Exactly. And given how steep Etna slopes are there, that rock failure just accelerated downhill incredibly quickly. Right. As it tumbled and mixed with the air, it became that uh, turbulent, really hot mixture, the pyroclastic flow that surged down into the Valle del Leon and Valle del Bove. Okay, and this is where those phoenix clouds come in. You mentioned them earlier. What exactly are those? The sources describe them rising above the main flow. Yeah, that's right. They're basically these big, billowing plumes of ash that detach and rise vertically from the main body of the pyroclastic flow as it travels down slope. Oh. They get that name because they look like they're rising independently, almost majestically, from the, well, the ashes of the ground-hugging flow. It's a really striking visual phenomena, a sort of secondary effect of the flow's own dynamics. Wow. Okay, so we have this flank failure, the big pyroclastic flow rushing down, and these amazing phoenix clouds rising up. What were the instruments telling us while all this was happening visually? Well, the seismic network was definitely busy. Your sources show that the instruments recorded uh, really high levels of volcanic tremor. Tremor, right. That's the continuous shaking, isn't it? Not, yeah. not like distinct earthquakes. Exactly. It's yeah. more like a constant vibration, often linked to magma or gas moving around underground. So high tremor levels located right under the southeast crater. What does that tell us? It's strong confirmation that there was intense activity, you know, energy release, happening right below where we saw the surface events. It's that look beneath the surface that the webcams can't give us. Okay, so the webcams show the collapse and flow. Seismic show the energy source underneath. Makes sense. But the eruption didn't just stop after that big flow, did it? No, not at all. The sources you provided indicate that after that initial very energetic pyroclastic phase, the activity actually uh, shifted. It transitioned more towards fountaining. Lava fountaining from the crater itself. Correct. More classic Strombolian or lava fountaining activity from the southeast crater. And then... Tying another piece in, there was the satellite data you included. What did that reveal later on? Right, the view from space. That added a crucial confirmation. A Sentinel-2 satellite pass was analyzed shortly after. On its show. It showed quite clearly um, a new thermal anomaly, basically the lava flow emerging onto the eastern flank of the volcano. Ah, so it confirmed that magma was actually reaching the surface and flowing out, not just the explosive collapse part. Precisely. It showed a hues of activity was also part of the picture, creating a fresh lava flow path. That's amazing how all these different views build the story. Okay, so quick recap based on your sources. We start with that flank instability on the southeast crater. It fails, triggers a massive pyroclastic flow, complete with phoenix clouds. Yep, all captured visually. While underneath, high volcanic tremor signals intense energy. Then the activity shifts to fountaining. Mm -hmm. And finally, satellite confirms a new lava flow is actually being laid down on the eastern side. You got it. It really shows the sequence 
how the instability led to the flow, how the internal energy kept things going, and how it ultimately resulted in new lava reaching the surface. A powerful sequence really underscores Etna's dynamism. Absolutely. And what's so valuable here is seeing how each method gives you something unique. The webcams give you the visual mechanics, the seismics give you the underground power source and location, and the satellite gives you that broader view, confirming things like new flows over time. You need all of them. You really do. Which kind of leads to a final thought, doesn't it? When you see how complex these events are, how quickly they change, and how you absolutely need these different views from the ground, from webcams, from space, to even begin to understand the full picture, what does that really tell us? About the challenge, sure, but maybe more about the critical importance of integrating all these monitoring tools to keep tabs on dynamic places like Etna.